Brightspace is the LMS that helps you reach every learner. It makes teaching and learning easier by letting you focus on what's most important, your students and their experience. You can start building courses quickly by simply dragging and dropping content into them. You can even create content right in the system, like adding images or videos with just a few clicks. The responsive interface looks great on a laptop, tablet, or smartphone, and it works on any device. Brightspace also lets you teach the way you want. Built-in communication tools let you create a connected learning experience with home page news feeds, online discussions, and web conferencing. And whether you're fully online, blended, or flipped, Brightspace lets you use lots of different pedagogical approaches like competency-based education and gamification. It helps you work smarter too. Built-in analytics lets you quickly check on how everyone in the class is doing. You can also dive deeper to review individual performance in more detail. And with smart rules and smart tools, you can automatically trigger activities based upon what a student does or doesn't do to personalize their learning experience. Easy, flexible, smart. That's Brightspace. And good evening from London. My name is Vikas Pota. I'm the founder of T4. Um, thank you all for joining in. If you, uh, those that are watching, you could actually go to the comment section and tell us where you're watching from. As you know, over this last um, year and a half, uh, since the pandemic has certainly been with us, we've been hosting these regular conversations with friends of ours from around the world so that we can all learn. And these technologies are now so much more accessible that we are glad that we can bring such opportunities to you. Now, if you do want to comment and if you do want to participate um, and you're watching on Facebook specifically, uh, there is something that you need to do to make sure that we can see your name uh, and, your, and your photo, your, your, your actual profile pic. Otherwise, we won't know who you are. So what you need to do is go to streamyard.com forward slash Facebook and give it permission so that we can see your, your name and your, and your, and your photo. Uh, the second thing is don't forget to join our groups. And if you're not on Facebook already, you can join our Facebook group, which is nearly 50,000 people strong now uh, and where this uh, live stream is also being shown. And you can join the conversation there. We also have following on, on LinkedIn. We have a group called T4 Education on the World. And of course, we have all my colleagues' um, own personal accounts, which also stream this. We have a very vibrant YouTube channel, as you know, also called T4 Education on Our World that you can, you can subscribe to, and a, a Twitter handle as well that you can go to. Now, goes without saying that I think you will know that uh, in a very few weeks, short few weeks, we have a mega event that's coming up. That event is called World Education Week, and the hope there is quite simply that, um, that these 100 schools uh, that we've selected from around the world and 20 other high-impact organizations, they've all developed an expertise in something. And that something is something that we can learn from. And that is why we call this an uh, incredible professional development opportunity for schools and teachers. If you wish to participate, and these are all free events, you can register at worldeduweek.org, as this says over here. Now, without further ado, I want to bring on a friend of mine and someone who I've really enjoyed uh, getting to know over the past year. Uh, and his name is Joe Pickerel. Joe is the Senior Strategy and Public Affairs Director at a technology business called D2L in Canada. Uh, Joe, welcome to this uh, T4 TV live stream. Thank you, Vikas. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be uh, an early supporter of T4. We love the work you're doing, not least because you're giving voice and a, a space for resources for the people that are at the coalface of education, teachers, educators, administrators, and so on. And uh, I look forward to this discussion today and to continuing our support uh, through you and with you. Fantastic, thank you so much for everything you do as well. So we have already, we have some friends from around the world who said they're watching. 
I don't know if you've ever been to Morocco, uh, Joe. Well, I we, have. We, you have. We have a Hiba from from Morocco. You've got a, a legend who is Akil Dalla from Tanzania, but currently he is in in the UK. And I, I I apologize to him. I know you've emailed me saying let's get together for coffee, <laughs> and I haven't responded. I apologize. I know you're down the road from where I live as well. Um, now this is what I meant. We don't know who you are. Hello from the UK. This is why you need to go to streamyard.com and give us permission. Now, Romania, I really like Romania, and but we don't know who you are. Uh, and so please, uh, please do give us permission by going to streamyard.com forward slash Facebook and allowing us. And of course, Veronica, buenas tardes, as they say. Um, lovely seeing you as well. Now, uh, Joe, in terms of like, you know, how I want to set up this conversation, it's quite simply having a conversation with you regarding well, from your vantage position of working in the technology sector around the world, and D2L is this incredible engine and machine of innovation that actually serves schools uh, around the world. Tell us, what is it that you have seen during the pandemic that actually we can, we can dig into a little bit about how we could lead better? And so the, the, the conversation today is about how do we future-proof education systems to withstand shocks? Uh, please uh, elucidate. Tell us what you think. Yeah, no, thank you for that in the introduction. And uh, I'll try and watch the chat and wave at those that are joining from all over the world. But uh, I'll focus right away into this question, which is how do we future proof the systems to withstand shocks? That planning starts now. The future is now. You know, we've said that, I think, time and again. It couldn't be more true, especially when it comes to education, because the experience of the last 18 months has not been a good one. Look, we are a maker of a platform called Brightspace. It's an online learning uh, platform, learning management system. Uh, we know that, that the experience of online has not been a good one. Uh, it's not been a good one in large part because there's a diversity of technology, some of it great, some of it less so, uh, but also just a diversity of approaches that has only complicated your job as educators. There's been stop, start, there's been try this, then try that. And often most of the tools you've been given have just been dropped at your feet or you've been told to go find it on your own. That's no way to plan. And thankfully, where we are right now, this moment in time, we're on a cusp of some very big things and very big changes, transformative changes. Um, that's in part very good news. I'm gonna tell you in a minute why we need to worry about that at the same time. It's very good news because that experience, that negative experience of the last 18 months has translated into a political problem for governments around the world. This is now an election issue in many uh, jurisdictions. It is certainly a front page issue. And certainly, I'm sure on your social media threads, you may have been uh, party to some of these discussions or posts as well. And politicians and governments around the world have taken note. So we're at a point now where some are emerging from the pandemic or hope to be, but at the very least, there's a reasonable capacity there now developing to focus on what comes next. How do we build back uh, around the world whilst still dealing with the day-to-day -day of the crisis. Um, and it's that moment in time that we need to get right. Because if we don't, and I'll come to you know how we do that in a moment, but if we don't get this right, we will see the mistakes of the past repeat themselves. There's going to be billions of pounds, dollars, pesos, rupees about to be spent on education. And what do politicians want? They want to change the headline and they want to do it fast because they don't have a lot of time. And that means they're going to want to buy things, things you can count, things you can picture and tweet, things you can point to. Uh, which is often hardware. Now, I'm not suggesting we don't need hardware, that you don't need those tools, but we need a better approach. Otherwise, uh, I'll give you one quick example. I guess in Mexico, uh, a few years ago, they had what was called the Pact for Mexico. This was an investment of 100 million US, about 2 billion pesos at the time, uh, in, in pretty rudimentary notebook laptops, which they preloaded. They didn't consult anyone about what they were preloading. They didn't provide any training. Uh, they didn't provide any continuity across jurisdictions, so people couldn't learn from one another. Uh, often students were had one laptop for one school and they needed another for another because it wasn't preloaded. Uh, a year later, it died a quiet death and you can now find those laptops on the secondary market. Um, and that is not just a unique case of Mexico, we've seen it around the world. Uh, the OECD has noted this to be a problem coming up uh, and yet spending continues to grow on things you can count because it's politically expedient to spend on those things. What I'm advocating for and what I hope we can figure out how to advocate for together is how do we build truly resilient systems and how do we create a comprehensive approach, encourage a comprehensive strategy to that spend 
so that it's not only on the things you absolutely need, like hardware, tablets, bricks and mortar in a lot of cases, connectivity in most, but also the training and you know, professional development more generally, the, the kind of system-wide approach so that you don't have to uh, teach one thing at one school and another at the neighboring school and kids are torn all over the place, uh, so that standards can be assessed and, and, and monitored and tracked so that you have a single place and a single login to do what you need to do, which is right now especially get back to doing what you're doing best and help extend the reach of the classroom. We're not arguing for a replacement of the classroom, not ever. But what we're trying to say is shocks will come again, whether they be climate related, future pandemic, uh, or what have you. Let's think about building a truly resilient system and that requires a comprehensive approach to the spend that's about to happen right now. And so um, forgive me for asking this question, Joe, and I know that we're friends and you're a sponsor of T4. But isn't this a little bit about the technology company pushing its own story? <laughs> it's a good question, and it's a fair question. Um, and that's why I ended there with saying, uh, and I'll come back to it, that we are not talking about replacing the classroom. We never will. But look, technology is here to stay. The question is, do you want the patchwork approach that frustrated so many? You know, some of some free tools and you know, log off now and go on to Zoom and log off Zoom and go on to your platform. Some email only, radio, which is one way, TV, which is one way, videos, which are one way, effectively. Uh, that's not quality teaching, and that's not who you are as teachers. Uh, what we're talking about is, look, if technology is here to stay, let's focus on what the right technology is, the best technology. Let's talk about standards for it. Let's set a bar that helps teachers extend their reach rather than frustrates their day-to-day. -day. Uh, that's all we're saying. I mean, so you 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 have um, highlighted, for example, the the case of I think you said Mexico, right? Yes. Um, who did it, in your opinion, badly? Uh, so who's done it rightly? Yeah, uh, you know what? It is there is no I, I can't really point to a single jurisdiction that's done it rightly, as you say, or even close to perfect. There are some sub national jurisdictions, some boards that have been given the flexibility. At the same time, uh, the, they have the wherewithal to know that they can't just have it be a free-for-all. Uh, so there's some jurisdictions in the, in the U.S., as you can imagine. There's some in Europe, uh, Germany, um, the Netherlands, not bad. Uh, so there's a handful, but it's such a small number. The key is, and, and what we're arguing for is, as much as I say a comprehensive strategy, I don't want to impose a straitjacket at the same time. That's not helpful for anyone. But what we're saying is, if you're about to spend billions have some framework so that uh, you don't get a patchwork, so that teachers are supported, so that you're, you're including as part of your terms of reference for what they procure for themselves, some standards around assessment and equity and accessibility and so on, which is just not the case when it's a free for all. And if you do that, but allow still decision-making where it might need to happen in some jurisdictions, the state level, uh, provincial level, or even lower than that, you create the right amount of flexibility to, to you know, integrate the curriculum and integrate the tools they need into a platform, which, by the way, ours allows for, uh, but also the standards that a jurisdiction needs, that a teacher depends on, and the training opportunities and so on. Right now, it's the Wild West, if I can borrow a, kind of an American term. And that's not helpful for anyone, especially teachers, especially educators, and, of course, students and parents who have found themselves all deeply frustrated uh, and not really knowing how to how to write the ship, even though they're the ones responsible for doing it. Um, and again, I put you on the spot, not because I'm trying to put you on the spot. I'm curious as to, do you know how much money is spent by government on technology procurement? Well, so um, if you you've got to take out defense spending. Sure. I mean, I mean education in the education sector. In the education sector, uh, I mean, obviously, it depends on the jurisdiction and what their priorities are. In a lot of places, it's about uh, connectivity, and that's a one-off, very large spend right now. So the numbers are quite high because there is a greater investment going on at the moment. But in terms of tools and software, it is a negligible percentage of any schools, any um, jurisdiction's budget right now, negligible. You know, it's, it's, it's the single percent figures mm. uh, across the board almost, because in most cases, a lot of jurisdictions are just looking for what's free, or they're spending the money on things like student um, record management software, and that's where the bulk of the spending goes. Uh, but that 
doesn't allow for what we're talking Let, about. Let's ask those that are watching, how do, what do you use technology most for in your education context? So if you're watching and you can just leave a comment, that'll be quite useful. Joe, in terms of like, you know, the vast T4 is, um, is a digital platform uh, that for teachers and schools, um, given your focus on resilient systems, uh, and of course, there's a, we understand what that is and the need for it. I mean, how does this relate to the teacher workforce or the educator workforce? Well, look, if, if we're not thinking about building kind of resilient systems, and within that is also resilient learners, then um, we're just going to repeat, repeat the mistakes of the past. And I don't just mean the Pact for Mexico type investment mistakes. I mean also all the things that have finally come to light. They've been there long before the pandemic, but we're finally exposed uh, in a way that I think more of the public were, were able to see with respect to uh, you know, equity and access and, and some of those issues is the standards and so on. Um, the fairness that is, is not inherent in a system that by its very nature, particularly in public education, should be. And so when I talk about bu building a resilient system, it is not exclusively, again, coming back to the notion of a comprehensive strategy, it's not exclusively about providing, you know, that literal resiliency that, that is necessary when um, a climate emergency happens, when there's a disruption in the community or, or God forbid, another another pandemic. Uh, you need a system that you can easily switch on and off and that people understand and know how to use for those moments, absolutely. Uh, but if you're not integrating that technology and technology generally into the day-to-day -day and supporting teachers so they can do that effectively and export who they are from the classroom into the online space, then you're not allowing the ability to build truly resilient learners because what we're talking about is also extending the reach of the classroom allowing students who need time to catch up and can't do so in a, in a class environment, which might only allow 15 minutes on any given subject, um, allowing them a, a safe space to catch up, allowing accelerated learners a, a space where they can plow forward or go deeper on something, all in a space that allows the teacher to see that and program in responses. They can be automatic. They can also be obviously, um, you know, through the actual person monitoring these things and providing prompts. That's how we build truly resilient learners who can not only withstand future shocks, but can also withstand the shock that is the adult workforce, which itself is going to be con consistently changing, is going to see them go through any number of new careers as they grow. And if they learn how to adapt and learn on their own with support through this system and make technology not just the place they access homework, but actually access what they need, how they want on their own time, they become resilient learners and that makes for a more resilient workforce and so on. Uh, that's what we're really talking about. And that requires a whole new way of thinking about online. So Akhil Dalla, if you read this comment says, uh, this happens all the time, this, you know, this laissez faire attitude which is 300 million pounds towards education in Tanzania was given. And no one knows, no accountability, no transparency, you know, but good for UK politics. Every uh, time. Every time. And so you, you wouldn't be surprised that last night we had a reshuffle of our government where, the, where the Secretary of State and the longstanding Minister of Schools, who everyone thought was unsackable, got fired. Um, and that leads to a new era, I think, in education policy, at least in the UK or in England. Uh, yeah. But Joe, in terms of, um, to ask you a few more questions regarding the use of technology, um, you know, again, if I was a system leader, right, what are the three things that you'd say to me in terms of to help guide my, my education, firstly, in terms of how I should engage with vendors and suppliers? Well, so I think what you need to start with is, is what I alluded to earlier, and I'll add a couple things to it. One is um, you need to be looking at something that allows for uh, what's sometimes called tight, loose integration. I don't love that term, but what it basically means is, do you have something that is replicable, uh, that allows for some of the things both district leaders need and, and government needs and board authorities need as well as teachers and so on. So a certain element of consistency and standards are there. Uh, for assessment uh, and for tracking and evaluation and so on, as well as the flexibility for a teacher who wants to integrate more video because that's their style or, or other tools as well. So they don't have to use the exact same sort of templated approach for every class. They have that flexibility to be their own teacher as they do in the classroom. But at the same time, there's enough built into the, to the, to the functioning, the administration of the product that they're looking for that 
there can be that that tracking, that assessment, that monitoring, that evaluation for the authorities, of course, where that's whatever they need to see, but also for other teachers. Uh, so they can share and they can move from one classroom and one grade to the next where they need to do things differently and still have one login, one set of clear instructions and so on. So it's it's a mixture of being able to do what the authorities need to do and officials need to see and the flexibilities teachers always need in one place. Well, uh, Joe, thank you so much for joining us here today on T4 TV. Uh, I'm told that the, uh, the, the mind space that people have for these kinds of interviews is no more than 20 minutes. I've been going for 23 minutes almost. Um, but I hope we will have the opportunity again to talk with yourself and your colleagues. Um, please know from the entire T4 community that we are immensely grateful to you for your, for your support and your sponsorship of everything that we do. Uh, and we really enjoyed this conversation. Um, I hope you didn't mind my pushback at the beginning, but it would be remiss of me not to remind you that this is an independent platform for teachers and educators. Um, on that note, thank you so much for participating, um, and we look forward to the next opportunity. Um, friends, friends um, we I, again, I want to remind you about World Education Week, which takes place on the 3rd to the 8th of October, uh, where we have over 100 uh, education events uh, that are taking place uh, held by schools and high impact organizations who will share their best practices and, and it's incredible professional development. So can you please, uh, can I please ask you to go and register for this event? Uh, friends, thank you again for your, uh, for your, for your patience and your, and, and your support. Uh, and we look forward to the next T4 TV. Goodbye.